Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, which continues the conversation in the 85 Federalist Papers about the proper structure of government. Today's episode features Professor John O. McGinnis, who is the George C. Dix Professor in Constitutional Law at Northwestern University School of Law. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. How did the Constitution address the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation? Today, we're speaking with Professor John McGinnis, who explains why the founders gave the federal government necessary but enumerated powers. How do checks and balances work in our Constitution? Structure of the Constitution matters because it orients our politics in a day-to-day basis, right? It gives rules of the road for politics, and that's very important to have hardwired rules about the nature of procedures, the nature of the different branches, is extremely important because otherwise politicians could make those institutions up for grabs. And that would be a great threat to stable, indeed stable and effective government. So that's one reason for structure. Another is to create balance government, to create a a system of federalism, a system of separation of powers, and that creates a a government that is uh, internally uh, balanced and internally balanced against itself. The federal government, the framers recognized, was giving a lot of authority to a potentially much more powerful government, and that's why it... um, created a balanced and structured government to make sure that within the government it would have its own checks and balances. It came from the nature of that awesome power that it recognized the federal government would have. And finally, the structure of government is really not independent of our rights. The structure of government is all about protecting our rights. The fact that you need to get a bill through two houses, signed by the president, uh, uh, and uh, have the president uh, decide to execute it against you, and have the judiciary defend you, you slows down government and is going to be a a protection of your rights. The fact that we have a federal system where one can exit from one state to another is a very important protection of rights. Not only if you don't like the states, but the governors of the states have to recognize that you may. There's a threat of that exit. So it's important to understand that the structural constitution is also a rights constitution. Thanks for that explanation on why structure matters. Now, can you tell us more about that structure? How does it work to create the balanced government you mentioned a few moments ago? Well, checks and balances constrain government simply by diffusing government power. And so it means that it's the opposite of having all power in one individual. And so it allows the fact of human disagreement to work for one's freedom. That's at its most basic level, because as as Madison famously famously said in Federalist 51, ambition checks ambition. And one way to think of this is that the framers were very well aware, in fact, they said that uh, fame is the passion of the most noblest minds. They recognized that There were people who were ambitious for fame, and that had some good consequences. They were ambitious for leaving society better off. On the other hand, it had some bad consequences. They might like to get fame through war, through oppression, through all sorts of mechanisms. The only way of dealing with this class of people was in some sense to pit them against one another, to give them different realms of authority. And so that's an important way that it Uh, the checks and balances work. The checks and balances also work, and I think this is not emphasized enough through time. 
So we have a House that is elected every two years. We have a Senate every six years, a president who's every four years. We always seem to be having elections. And that's important because people's passions can be very evanescent. And if we had a structure of government, which didn't have the check and balance of uh, different elections, that would be very dangerous to people because they need to think again. So the checks and balances are not only checks and balances of individual government actors in the Constitution, they're checks and balances against the people themselves. And that's very important to understand. It's also the judiciary can be understood in that way. These are people with life tenure who are appointing, who are uh, uh, enforcing a constitution that hopefully represents a much greater consensus. And that's also a check against the pe people themselves. Uh, famously, uh, it is said that the role of judicial review is to protect Peter Sober from Peter Drunk. And so when the checks and balances are discussed as if it's all about protecting against rulers, that's only half the story. The people themselves, as the framers well knew, were an unruly bunch. Uh, and they needed to have a check and balance system to prevent their own passions from spilling over to their own danger. So the problem that the founders of our Constitution face was, they certainly was well known to have a balanced government, checks and balances in government. But previously, the idea had been to use social classes to do that. We had a House of Lords in England, the sort of the rich defined by land at the time. They had their own political power and the monarchical principle, a hereditary monarch. But of course, this was dependent on different um, social classes, and the United States did not have that. It had one social class. So the question was how to construct a, um, uh, a balanced government, one with checks and balances in a world where there was a uniform, there were, there were no uh, class divisions, there was no monarchical principle. Some people thought it was unnecessary uh, in what was called the critical period, the period before the Constitution was created. Some state constitutions had unicameral legislatures. They gave a lot of uh, direct, uh, more direct authority to the people. Could you tell us more about this period? The drafters of the Articles of Confederation were hesitant to borrow too much from the British system, right? In that they hesitated to create strong federal powers resembling the monarchy or even parliament, instead giving states and individuals more power. But this led to some drawbacks. What were they? And how did they lead to the drafting of the Constitution we have today? The Articles of Confederation were thought to lead to two important dangers. One was the Articles of Confederation had no permanent executive. And the concern, and I think this may have been the more important of the two concerns, was that without a permanent executive, one that could control the military, the United States was a much weaker uh, actor than it had to be. And one must remember that the United States was not the United States of today. There were many more powerful actors. The, the idea was the British might come back. Uh, but of course, there was Spain, there was uh, France. All of these actors were in much larger uh, numbers of men at arms. So, and so if the United States couldn't deter them through the sense that they could put an army on the field that wouldn't uh, depend on requisitions from various states, so it wouldn't have its own source of money, that it wouldn't have a unified and permanent command. This was a huge risk. So I think that it was the, the greatest concern was that the United States might not continue as a going concern unless there was a much better way to organize its defense. The second reason that it was thought 
to be not a success. Uh, and I think this was less important, but still, many thought that the uh, United States was uh, not working well as a commercial republic. It's not working well for a few reasons. One was that uh, some states were putting up trade barriers against one another, and that was limiting the extent of the market and therefore the extent of commercial vibrancy. And moreover, some states as well uh, were uh, subject to um, uh, passions to relieve debtors of their obligations. And so, of course, that meant people weren't very eager to invest if they couldn't be very confident they would be paid back. And so, the real reason, I think, for the Constitution was first to create a government that um, empowered uh, national defense, and the second was to create a commercial republic. And so they had to recreate a balanced government in the new world of the lack of social classes. And so the way they did that was to create, to use different branches of government, but st and still have them all, in some sense, responsible to a democratic element, but to a different kind of democratic element. The House very consciously was uh, closest to the people, most frequently elected, the Senate a little less so, the presidency had an indirect election through the presidential electors, the uh, judiciary was life tenured. All of these were decisions that reflected the idea that they needed to uh, break up government, break it up precisely also because of the leaders, and also the concern that there would be sort of one social class that actually might make um, a greater danger of unitary government, a greater danger of oppression. And the way they did that was to, create, to, to actually create and lay out different uh, branches of the federal government. That was one way they did it. The other way they did it was just to make sure that the federal government had only enumerated powers. The other great theory was we're going to have uh, to split, as, as Justice Kennedy said, the atom of sovereignty, uh, and that would be another uh, uh, constraint on, on the government. And that was a, that was a really a kind of uh, a, a new uh, idea, maybe a new idea that came from necessity, because there were still local uh, powers uh, of local government that really weren't going to be happy with a unified national government. But that was the second uh, way of, uh, of, of creating a balanced government in a new world without social classes. Well, the Constitution creates a permanent executive, it creates a permanent judiciary, so it creates actually three branches of government. And so that does two things simultaneously. It seems to create both more different centers of power, but for certain kinds of actions, it creates more effective government. It puts the uh, president famously as commander in chief. It makes the judiciary uh, a permanent uh, watchdog over the structure of government, precisely because the government becomes more intricate. There needs to be a judiciary to sort out the um, divisions within the government. So that's one matter it does. The other matter it does is that it actually gives the government certain powers, as I suggest, that really go to creating or preserving a commercial republic, commerce clause, a law of uniform bankruptcy, a post office may not seem very important to us today, but to have interchange among different states. Uh, also to have direct ability to do some taxation uh, to support, uh, I think, primarily a military. So I think you can think of really all of the enumerated powers of the federal government as in one way or another contributing to a defense of the United States or um, uh, a uh, better uh, commercial republic. Those are, the, those, are, those are the overwhelming objectives of the original Constitution. This view at the time of the founding wasn't unanimously popular, was it? Weren't there some objections to the powers given to the federal government? 
Well, the greatest concern of the um, uh, anti-federalists was that ultimately uh, this would lead to what they called consolidated government, that there would be uh, essentially a mass of powers in the federal government and the states would really have very little powers and that would also threaten tyranny because there'd be so many powers in the federal government. And they thought this for a variety of reasons. Uh, they thought, first of all, that uh, the enumerated powers were not sufficiently enumerated. That, And secondly, they were very worried about the federal judiciary because their idea was the federal judiciary, and this, they seem to be early uh, people of institutional concerns about public choice and institutional design. The federal judiciary being federal actors would be interested in consolidating uh, the federal government for their own purposes. And so they were just not at all confident uh, that the enumerated powers would do the jobs because it was imperfectly enumerated and because the custodians of that enumeration really were not impartial. I mean, just sociologically, there were many people who were powerful in their states who didn't want to see their states uh, disappear. Uh, but it was also important because People were concerned about giving too much power to the federal government. And leaving power in the states not only meant the federal government was limited, it meant there was another source of attachment that people had that was not to the federal government that would be a restraint on the federal government. I think that's very important to understand, particularly socially, that many people thought their primary allegiance was to their own state. And I think the Constitution was playing off of that, was playing off of the idea that uh, against the fears of the anti-federalists, that it would be all be consolidated, was that most citizens would consider their primary attachment to their states. They would look at the federal government as a kind of necessary evil. And that would be a constraint on going too far from the enumerated powers. So they were used, they were trying to build on what they had. They were building on what they had, which was state attachments, which was going to be not only as, a, uh, as an institution, but as an allegiance to constrain uh, federal power. But creating three branches of government weren't completely new, were they? How did they appear in the British Constitution? How similar were they? And how were they different? All of the branches had their um, uh, ancestors, as it were, in the British Constitution. Uh, one way of thinking of the British Constitution in relation to the American Constitution is at least the executive power of the king was largely given to the president, and then some exceptions were made. Uh, but, uh, and then, of course, the president, it was not a hereditary principle, which was also a way of constraining the executive power. But there's no doubt that the model for the nature of executive power came from the British Constitution. Bicameralism also came from the British Constitution. There was a House of Lords, uh, there was a parliament. But again, because there was no social divisions, uh, that wasn't the way they structured it. They structured it differently. Uh, but, the, but having two houses was, also, was extremely important because it allowed uh, the um, uh, framers also to give greater recognition to state authority because they, of course, proportioned the House of Representatives by popular um, uh, uh, proportions and the Senate by the state. So the second house served a lot of different functions. It served the function of just having another house to restrain it, but also to giving greater weight to, to states. And then finally, I think the framers also thought, while they uh, were not different classes, they uh, also thought that um, uh, senators would be, uh, tend to be a more, uh, uh, elite group who were elected. So they didn't want to completely give up the idea that, uh, uh, that, there, would, that there, there would be certain um, uh, very important people elected who I think they thought might well be senators. So this was all patterned, but uh, adapted to a new world without uh, class divisions. Perhaps the greatest innovation uh, was to uh, set up a, um, uh, to have an Article Three, because of course, while um, uh, 
uh, there was a judiciary in England, its rights and its duties were perhaps a little less unclear. They were clear by tradition, but they really hadn't been set up uh, so formally in law. And that, I think, was a requirement of the system because for two reasons. One, uh, I think the intricacy of the design meant that they thought there'd be some real questions that would arise. And then also, I think some thought that um, uh, that the judiciary would be a way of protecting some of these commer the commercial republic. In other words, that give clauses in the original constitution, like the contracts clause that protected the obligation of contracts, would just be paper if the judiciary was not there to enforce that against debtor relief legislation. And so that was, I think, the way of thinking about judiciary was not so much in the modern way of protecting individual rights as we think of them, but as uh, protecting the structure of the Constitution and protecting essentially the foundations of a commercial republic. Can you tell us more about how the separation of powers works? In creating three branches of government, the founders divided power, and they also gave individual branches enumerated powers, right? What are the advantages to that setup? How did they check and balance one another? The Constitution goes back to uh, an idea that uh, pre-exists. Uh, the Constitution was that there it's good to have a government of separated powers for two reasons. Partly because of the conflict that it engenders, that uh, which is the same as the idea of we want conflict between the federal and state government but also because that we're going to have different competencies in the different governments, in the different branches of government. So the idea is that uh, to represent the people and to get various ideas and interests, well, the legislature is best at doing that. Actually, we want to have many people to do that, because otherwise it's going to be hard to represent all of their interests. And we want to have a quite uh, uh, free form, relatively free form. They're going to pass legislation after deliberation, and uh, they're going to have powers to, at least along any subject matter line, they're given authority to do so, uh, to do so as they wish. With respect to the executive, the idea is, well, it's the legislature is not good at executing the law. First of all, it doesn't have uh, really the bureaucracy to do so. Moreover, it doesn't even have the standards and even impartiality to do so. The very um, kind of interests may make it very likely to be um, uh, not a disinterested executor of the law. So that's one aspect to it. Now, we also, the executive allied with that, is thought to be very important in carrying out the defense of the realm. So the executive is interestingly not just about law execution, but is also about uh, the idea of uh, defense, what was called the confederative power. Uh, in lock. And so those are really joined together in the executive as areas of competency. And then the judiciary is thought to be uh, the most uh, uh, dispassionate branch, or in the Federal 78, the least dangerous branch, the branch that can be trusted with uh, uh, protecting uh, the way the law is uh, carried out. And in our structure of government, because we have a complicated structure of government, being the arbiter uh, in determining how the various parcels are going to be uh, interpreted. Well, one way of thinking about it is that uh, the idea of having separated powers and separated powers that are enforced by the judiciary is you prevent a, a, a cartel against the people. You might think that the rulers, and I think this is how often the framers thought about them, might sort of gang up on the people. But if they're actually given provinces, they may become jealous of those provinces. Moreover, if they're prevented from entering other provinces, they really can't agree to exercise power jointly. And so it's an idea that uh, to prevent trades 
among the, uh, uh, the different branches, because even if that leads to more efficient government, when general economics, we think trade is great, the accommodation is great, as the court is often emphasized in talking about the separation of powers, efficiency is not the only objective. So while we have the specialization is uh, lead to some kinds of efficiency, the division may lead to inefficiency up to the price we're willing to pay uh, for uh, uh, the conflict it engenders and also simply the, 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 the diminution of unitary power that it uh, enforces. You have to have all three branches acting together. So you have to have the Congress pass some legislation to take to trench on your rights, very broadly understood. Then the executive has to decide to enforce that legislation. And then the judiciary has to say that that enforcement is not only constitutional, but say that it's within the bounds of the law, that they've applied the right law to you. So, right, that's it. So there are three stages at which your rights are protected. And that, I, I think, is not emphasized enough. But we're so used to that idea. But for much of human history, there wasn't that. If I might make an anecdote, one time I was traveling in uh, Syria. And I thought it was quite extraordinary that the president, who then was al Assad, uh, over parliament, he was represented as a parliamentarian. When you got to his executive, he was represented as executive. And actually, there he was as a judge, being in the cloak of the judge. So that really brought home to me that it really is not a, to be dismissed that uh, we have to persuade three different, not only three different people, but three different groups of people in an institution that have shaped their interests differently before our rights can be trenched on. That is an extremely important aspect of the Constitution that, at least so far, I mean, that, 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 that is extremely important, that may sometimes be raised questions about how far we have it are, are, are issues raised by the rise of the administrative state, but that in ordinary legislation, and certainly the model that the founders had of, uh, uh, of government action to take away your rights was a very important screen of protection, that it was hard to pass legislation. In fact, you might say that uh, bicameralism is really tricameralism, you not only have to pass the House, the Senate, you've got to get the, the signature of the president, uh, political scientists have seen that it acts like a sort of mild supermajority rule. Really, you don't, it's not enough to have a majority support for legislation. You really need to have more than majority of the country. So that it creates a good deal of uh, inertia. So this is two important protections. One, you have to think of the separation of powers as a protection of federalism. Because quite beyond the enumeration of powers, the fact is that it's hard to get federal legislation. And when you can't get federal legislation, the states can act. And so uh, that's an important aspect. Uh, it's one of the most important aspects of the protection of, of federalism. Also, it's a, a protection of other kinds of social norms, right? The, in other words, uh, there's uh, markets, other norms of society that not, are not acted through government. If you had a government that could very easily act on whims, those other norms could be uh, more easily suppressed or supplanted uh, or substituted for. And uh, that's, in some sense, as important a protection of the states and has actually proved uh, uh, maybe a more protect, important protection of the states than the enumerated uh, powers. So at least the classical view of the separation of powers in government is it means it's laborious government. It's time consuming government. It's government that may necessarily have to have a relatively limited uh, agenda. That's a uh, protection of liberty. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students.
Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org forward slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash N-O-8-6. Thanks for listening. See you in class.